Okay, so here we're going to talk about our blood and tissue protozoa pathogens. And so we're going to talk about Plasmodium toxoplasma gondii, Negleria, as well as Acanth amoeba. Our Plasmodium is our most famous of all of our parasites, of course, because this is the causative agent of, plasmo of malaria. And Plasmodium is going to be uh, in the category of Sporozoan, and it's a parasite of our red blood cells. But that's not the whole story of our Plasmodium species. In our body, Plasmodium actually has to infect our liver first before it can infect our red blood cells. It's going to require two hosts. It has a mosquito, which is for its sexual reproductive stage, and humans or some other um, hosts for asexual reproductive stage. Of course, it's going to be very important in areas where you have high incidences of malaria, such as in Africa, and it's going to cause 1 to 5 billion febrile episodes and 1 to 3 million deaths annually, so it has a high disease burden in these areas. There are five species that can infect humans, but um, Plasmonium falciparum is going to be the most um, aggressive form of the disease and is going to be the most common cause of malignant malaria worldwide. Now, an Anopheles mosquito is going to be the vector for transmission of the plasmodium um, parasites. The infectious sporozoites are going to be introduced um, into the blood via a blood meal. And then these sporozoites are going to be carried to the liver. So the first stage of this is actually going to be in your liver. So primary, where is it? Oh, here, liver. So this is a primary site of replication. So the sporozoites are going to get into the liver, and they're going to go through cytosomy, um, which basically is just asexual reproduction. And then you're going to get a exo-erythrocyte cycle. And this is going to last anywhere from a week to three weeks. And so at this time, the parasite is, of course, replicating and turning or becoming a form of the parasite that can then go on to infect your, white, your red blood cells. Your hepatocytes, similar to what happens with viruses, are eventually going to be killed and ruptured and they're going to release our merozoites. The merozoites are the stage that can infect the red blood cells. So this is the red blood cell infectious stage. Now your asexual reproduction in the red blood cells is going to contain various forms. You're going to have a ring stage oops, shown here in which you have sort of the red blood cell looks like a little donut with the center and it has a little um, parasite that looks like it has a ring in it. You also have a trophozoite stage, similar to all our other parasites. This is where it's a feeding stage. Um, and you have a schizont stage. Eventually, your red blood cells will also be destroyed and they are going to release merozoites as well. Now, your merozoites can develop into male or female gametes. And this is how it gets picked up by a mosquito. So the mosquito is going to bite an infected person and pick up the male or female gametes, and that will start the cycle or sexual reproduction in the actual mosquito. Now, Plasmodium is found mostly in tropical, subtropical areas of Africa, India, Russia, China, and Asia. They are all going to have that same similar life cycle. They're all going to require a mosquito vector. And they all have a liver phase, a red blood cells phase. They all four do asexual reproduction inside of humans, sexual reproduction inside of your mosquitoes. So all of that is the same. Human infections are going to, of course, start with that bite from the Anopheles mosquito. And that is going to um, in, introduce sporozoites into the humans. So remember, sporozoites are going to initially infect your hepatocytes, and then you're going to form merozoites, and those are going to infect your red blood cells. 
and the mosquitoes are going to ingest the sexually mature forms and start them all over again, the gametes. Now the clinical disease is going to depend on the species of your plasmodium that you're infected with. Plasmodium falciparum is going to again be that one that causes the most severe symptoms and is the one that is um, the primary target for antimalarial as well as um, vaccines. The onset of the disease can be acute, um, fever, chills, and then your symptoms are going to be periodic and it's synchronized to infection and rupture of those red blood cells and the release of new merozoites. Um, Plasmodium vivax and oval can establish a dormant liver stage. So basically they can hang out in the liver for many years before they cause a red blood cell stage. Now diagnosis is gonna be detection of the parasite in the red blood cell using a GIMSA stage. GIMSA stains is a, a, able you to see intracellular. So it's an intracellular stain. And then you can see these little dark areas in your red blood cell. Here's a ring structure right here. Um, and this is another ring structure over here. And so de detection of those characteristic forms within the red blood cell is going to be diagnostic. You can have nuclear um, nucleic acid test also, uh, but these are not used widely, primarily because of the areas that this is found in. You need a lot of instruments and a lot, and sometimes it's very expensive to do those types of tests. So it's just simply looking under the microscope at a blood smear that's been stained Ginza is much more economical. Now your immune assays are in, available, but they're not gonna be as sensitive or as quick as microscopy. Now treatment is going to be complicated, um, so there are CDC guidelines, so uh, refer to CD gui CDC guidelines if you do need to treat this. Prevention is going to be through protective clothing, mosquito repellents, um, taking um, pre-exposure prophylactic antibiotics when traveling to certain areas. Vaccines are under investigation and actually there's one that's been uh, approved And this is really a, the hepatitis B vaccine plus a plasmodium antigen. And it's about 40% protective in children. But this is very new and it just got approved. All right, our next guy is Toxoplasma gondii. This is related to Plasmodium because it's a sporozoa. Um, this one is going to be found in many animals, such as birds and humans, but there's only one species that exists, so it infects all of them. The reservoir for humans is the house cat and other felines. This is the one that you don't wanna change your kitty litter if you're pregnant. So we're going to have development of the organisms in the intestines of the actual cat. So in the cat, you have a trophozoite phase, a merozoite phase, sexual reproduction, and then you get an immature cyst that forms. Um, the maturation into active cysts is going to be in three to four days in the external environment. So this is going to be three to four days. And so if you change your kitty litter regularly every day, you're not going to be exposed to this, but if you let it sit for several days, you can be exposed to the active um, oocyst. And then the oocysts are going to be in, with ingested and they have sporozoites inside of them. And then the sporozoites are going to um, form um, tachyozoites in tissue cells. And then you're going to have cysts with bradyzoites form and you have sporozoites and bradyozoites that are going to be taken up by the cat. So your, your oocysts ingested are going to be able to produce acute and chronic infections in tissues, including the brain. What this means is that you can't get rid of toxo. And so if you can't get rid of toxo then to and your immune system becomes compromised, um, people ha can have a um, spread of toxo and that can cause a lot of problems in immune incompetent or immune compromised individuals. Immune competent individuals, you'll be able to keep the oocyst and the um, 
the trophozoites under control. And so even if you have toxin, you get pregnant, um, typically your immune system will be able to control it because you have antibodies, you have T cell responses, etc. If it's a new infection with toxo during the pregnancy, that's when your fetus is most at risk because you don't have any of those protections. You have no antibodies, you have no T cell responses, and so your toxo can infect the growing fetus. Now your oocysts, again, are going to be ingested. The tropho trophozoites are going to be the infectious form, and they are going to form the tachyzoites. The tachys are going to be slender in like a little crescent form, and then they're going to divide very rapidly, and these are in involved with the initial infection, dissemination, and tissue damage. These are eventually going to become bradyzoites, but these are going to be more slow growing, uh, and these are going to be more in the chronic phase. So toxo is going to be worldwide. Um, toxo is, again, domestic cat is a reservoir, a very important reservoir for humans. Um, toxoplasma, though, can also um, be transmitted through contaminated meat sources, um, beef, pork, sausages, those type of things as well. Butchers can have get exposure to toxo. The parasites, again, are going to be part of the cat. In the cat, they're going to um, replicate. And then the oocytes that are non-infectious are going to be released. They have to mature in the environment. And during their mature maturation, they're going to form two sporocysts and each are going to contain four sporozoites each. The humans have to um, get exposed to the mature oocysts, and that's going to be about two to three days after uh, the cat has defecated. You can also get this from improperly cooked meats, and of course you can get transplantal, um, placental transmission. The clinical disease is typically going to be asymptomatic. Your immune system, again, is going to control the infection, but it's not going to clear the parasite. Um, it's most severe in the fetus or immune-compromised patients. You're going to get massive tissue destruction, cysts, abscess formation, meningitis, cerebral mass lesions can develop, um, etc. Diagnosis is going to depend, again, on your... Um, immune status, um, sorry, a diagnosis is going to depend on detection of, here we have cysts and infected tissues, so this um, is an important diagnostic of these um, chronic stages of toxo. Your mild infections are going to be managed by your immune system, but then again, if you do um, become immune compromised at some state, those infections can spread. Prevention is avoidance of cat feces and undercooked meat. Now finally, let's talk about our living amoebas, our free living amoebas. We have Nucleria and Acantha amoeba. Both of them are going to be found just in natural in the environment, in soil and water environments, freshwater environments. Infections are going to occur mostly associated with recreational water sports, swimming in a pond, for example. Uh, you can also inhale the cyst in dust. Ocular infections of acanthamoeba are important because of contact lenses. So if you clean your contact lenses with non-sterile cleaning solutions, such as just simple tap water, um, you can introduce acanthamoeba into your eyes. Now, Nagleria is going to have worldwide distribution. Again, it's going to be associated with freshwater lakes and rivers. You're going to get exposure to those trophozoites in the water. This is not cysts. These are active um, eating and um, metabolically active trophozoites. The parasite is going to enter through the nose and migrates to the brain. So usually you're swimming and you take in water through the nose and if you're exposed to that trophozoite, it can burrow through your t tissue and into the brain. Um, the clinical disease is amoebic meningoencephalitis. Basically, this guy goes everywhere once it gets into your brain. Your bacteria typically will stay in the meninges, um, the, uh, the, what surrounds your brain. Your viruses will typically infect the brain proper and encephalitis. And these amoebas, they just go everywhere in your brain. So it's a combination of the two. The symptoms is going to be a frontal headache, sore throat, fever, um, altered sense of taste and smell, 
stiff neck, the Koenig sign, which is basically very stiff um, signs. Cerebral spinal fluid will be cloudy or purulent, and it's going to contain amoebas. Unfortunately, it has a very rapid death in four to five days of exposure, so usually the um, diagnosis is post-mortem. Nagleria is, again, going to be a post-mortem diagnosis. Treatment is going to be generally ineffective because it's just such a very rapid clinical course. Um, there is some experimental drugs through the CDC that you can get. And the prevention is very difficult. Um, if you have a child, if you're a young child going swimming, use a nose plug and um, try to get them not exposed to this. Acanth amoeba, again, is another um, amoeba that can um, disseminate to your brain. This guy is going to, again, be mostly associated with dialysis and contact lens cleaners. The clinical disease is typically going to be keratitis through those contact lenses. Um, and it can lead to destruction of the cornea. These amoebas, they are just going to eat your tissues. You can get an encephalitis dissemination of acanth amoeba, and this can lead to granulomatomous amoebic encephalitis, and typically immune compromised. This has a much slower progression than nagleria. Nagleria is very fast. This one is a little bit slower. So diagnosis, depending on where it is, um, eye scrapings, keratitis will be microscopic looking for your little trophozoites. Um, encephalitis will be examination of brain tissue. Treatment is going to, again, be very uh, ineffective um, because of the rapid course of the disease. So use sterile cleaning solutions for contact lenses and avoid using contact lenses if your eye is actually irritated.